So once again, San Joaquin Valley, let's give a, a warm, warm round of applause uh, and a thank you for all of our four community partners who were spotlighted today. Cultural Brokers, LGBTQIA, Two-Spirit Collaborative, Community Alliance of Family Farmers, and EMAC with, for what a wonderful work that they've been doing, critical work that they've been doing, the lives they've saved over the, the pandemic, um, and, and the re-envisioning of what the San Joaquin Valley can look like. What a wonderful day to start. What a, what a fun, wonderful way to start our day today. So let's keep the celebration going. Equity in the Mall and the grant making of the San Joaquin Valley Health Fund are all guided by the iHeal platform. The platform is center, centered in and created by our community partners who are working in the areas of immigration, health, housing, education, environmental justice, land use and planning, and more recently, the digital divide. As we have mentioned throughout the last two days, the San Joaquin Valley residents uh, don't face these issues in silos. So the solutions that we bring to the table must also uh, work in the, at the intersections of all these issues to provide a more holistic approach to the issues at hand and again, uplift the voices of our community partners and residents. Yesterday, we got to hear from our education, housing and land use and digital divide subcommittees. Uh, and today we'll hear from the rest. So to kick off our first iHeal policy platform presentation for day two, we have the immigration subcommittee. Today, advocates and community leaders will highlight the key milestones, historic policy systems, change victories, and identify opportunities to continue to facilitate equitable access to services and opportunities for immigrant families and residents in the San Joaquin Valley. It is my pleasure to introduce the Immigration Policy Subcommittee to the stage. Welcome, Eduardo. How are you doing? Good morning, Sergio. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Today's panel discussion um, is brought to you by the San Joaquin Valley Health Fund's Immigration Policy Subcommittee. You know, we're very excited to be part of the seventh annual Equity on the Mall. And I am Eduardo Ramirez Castro. I am the Associate Project Director of the Sustainable Rural Communities Project here at California Rural Legal Assistance Foundation based out of Fresno. And I'm also the co-chair of the San Joaquin Valley Health Fund's Immigration Policy Subcommittee. And I will also, unfortunately, you know, because I'm not the best, be serving as your moderator for today's event. Can we go ahead to the first slides, please? Wonderful. The first slide, the slide before that one. Wonderful. Um, I'm also very honored to introduce, you know, um, you to our immigration subcommittee co-chair, Allison Davenport. Uh, she's a supervising attorney at the Immigrant Legal Resource Center. Uh, Allison and I are very privileged uh, to be with you today and to share this space with incredible partner organizations <clears throat> who are leading literally life-changing work across the San Joaquin Valley. We will begin today by providing a little bit of background about the Immigration Policy Subcommittee. Then <clears throat> we're gonna be hearing from various panelists. They are the change makers and on the ground leaders themselves. And at the end, we will reserve some time to address some questions or comments that you may have. So as a little bit of background, the Immigration Policy Subcommittee is comprised of over 30 immigrant serving uh, organizations um, in the San Joaquin Valley. And each year, this committee develops a policy platform that serves as a year-round organizing tool that fuels partners' local, regional, and statewide advocacy, and also partners' ongoing partnerships uh, with impacted communities, elected representatives, and policymakers. The 2022 Immigration Policy Platform is both opportunistic and aspirational. It is a reflection of the promise of the San Joaquin Valley and its commitment of its organizations and leaders to advance health and racial equity. The Immigration Policy Subcommittee's uh, mission uh, is to ensure inclusive communities where all immigrants and refugees, regardless of income or place of residence, enjoy access to support services, economic opportunity, 
high quality legal representation, and also meaningful, meaningful access to civic participation. Because we believe and, and we fight for the, the idea that a just and equitable and prosperous San Joaquin Valley requires an inclusive democracy and due process for all. Now that we have provided some background, let's move on to the panel discussion where we will get to hear from the change makers themselves. Our panelists are advocates and community leaders who will highlight key milestones, historic policy and systems change victories, and who will also identify for us opportunities to continue to facilitate equitable access to services and opportunities for immigrant families in the San Joaquin Valley. I have the pleasure of introducing our first panelist, Allison Davenport. Allison is our very own born and raised San Joaquin Valley resident and attorney. She joined the Immigrant Legal Resource Center in 2015. She leads various projects in the San Joaquin Valley to advance the rights of immigrant families and to enhance the local legal capacity of partner organizations. Prior to joining the ILRC, she was a clinical instructor with the International Human Rights Law Clinic at UC Berkeley Law. At the clinic, she directed domestic and international projects, including the establishment of the legal support program for undocumented students on the UC Berkeley campus, the documentation of human rights abuses against LGBTI individuals in El Salvador, and the promotion of equal access to clean water in California. Previously, Allison practiced immigration law for several years, first in private practice, and then went on to found the Immigration Legal Services Program at Centro Legal de la Raza in Oakland, where she later served as a legal services director. Allison earned her law degree from UC Berkeley Law. And please join me in welcoming Allison. And Allison, the mic is yours. Thank you, Eduardo, and thank you to my um, fellow panelists for, for being here today. It's an honor to, 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 to appear um, side by side with you all. Um, we're going to talk about various things during the panel impacting um, immigrant residents of the San Joaquin Valley. Um, and really, all aspects of the IHEAL platform right, have particular impacts. Um, and impact in particular ways immigrant communities in our region. But I want to take a few minutes just to think about um, access to immigration legal services in our, in our region and what we're doing to address the justice gap for families um, in our region. Um, we have seen a lot of growth uh, in terms of our legal capacity in our region, but we have a long, long way to go to fully meet the legal needs of families in our region. I know we're all familiar with uh, the San Joaquin Valley uh, and, you know, the region we're talking about. Um, people know this, the communities here intimately, but I just want to ground us quickly in the geography of our region because I think it plays a really important role when we're talking about access to legal services um, and the demographics of our region as well, um, what that means uh, in terms of access to legal services. So the San Joaquin Valley, we have the, this eight county region, um, 300 miles, right? So a large rural um, expanse um, in the heart of California. Um, in this region, there's approximately um, 926,000 uh, uh, residents who were foreign born, who were born in another country who are immigrants. And those folks hold a whole host of different types of immigration um, statuses. Uh, some are undocumented, some have a temporary status, some have a green card or permanent residence, some are naturalized U.S. citizens. Um, but I do want to highlight that we have around 300,000 undocumented residents um, in our region. Uh, so it's a very significant portion, about a third of that overall um, immigrant population. And over 20% of children under the age of 18 in our region live with at least one undocumented parent. Um, so that's a really significant um, um, portion um, of the regional um, immigrant population. Um, something not on the slide, but I do want to mention is 
There's another uh, quarter of a million people who have green cards uh, living in the, in the San Joaquin Valley and who are eligible to become U.S. citizens. Um, so that's a, also a huge uh, population that um, is uh, eligible to kind of take that final step in a very complicated and expensive um, and oftentimes scary immigration uh, journey and become a U.S. citizen um, to receive the full protections of U.S. citizenship. Um, and also that means that's a, you know, a potential quarter of a million new voters uh, in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, so we really have a patchwork, right? Um, we have the 300,000 undocumented, about 250 50,000 uh, green card holders. And then a lot of uh, the remaining folks have different forms of status. Uh, some are refugees, uh, some are uh, uh, have other forms of temporary status like a, a U visa, uh, temporary protected status, et cetera. So it's really a patchwork um, of, of the communities and the types of, of status and protections uh, folks have. Um, that patchwork that we see at the regional level is also reflected in individual households and families. So it's very common that we have um, mixed status families um, in our region as, as elsewhere uh, in, the, in the country. Um, so a kind of common scenario would be that there's an undocumented parent in a home. Uh, maybe there's a child in that home that has DACA, so has a kind of a temporary protection, and then maybe a younger sibling was born in the United States um, and is a U.S. citizen. So that kind of patchwork of status um, and protections um, is played out not just at the regional level, but in very um, local ways, like in one household and, and one family. And that means people have a very different uh, pathways and access to different services, uh, benefits, and opportunities. So kind of with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about the legal services landscape um, in the San Joaquin Valley. And I've been doing a lot of thinking about what's our current capacity, where are we at, and how can we strategically move forward? So I'm just sharing some takeaways um, from a little bit of research we've done at the ILRC about capacity in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, I want to highlight some of our strengths because we have a lot of strengths in the Valley, um, and I'm so impressed with how much work, how effective um, advocates are on the ground in the San Joaquin Valley, despite a lot of the challenges and limited resources that they have. Um, so we have a really strong network of organizations and advocates. Um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about attorneys, but uh, in a moment, but accredited representatives. These are folks who are not attorneys, but have been certified by the Department of Justice to provide immigration legal services. They're really the backbone of immigration legal services in our region. Um, and there's just some very, very strong accredited reps, um, people that I call to talk about cases with, refer cases to. Um, these are really the people who are doing the, the heavy lifting um, every day in the communities in terms of providing direct legal services. Um, we also have strong partnerships with key institutions, uh, things like the certain school districts, um, health centers, uh, libraries. Um, we also have the Mexican consulate in, in Fresno. And these are really great partnerships that kind of help us leverage our legal resources and reach uh, more people. Um, there's also a strong trend of collaboration with groups outside of our region, so trying to maximize the resources or bring in resources from other regions in order to provide more services locally. Um, so we see um, Bay Area partners having a strong presence in our detention uh, facilities in our region. Unfortunately, the Central Valley, uh, rather than seeing a decline in detention, uh, immigration detention uh, space. Uh, we've seen a dramatic increase over the last several years, um, particularly in Kern County. And we have a, a, you know, we rely heavily on Bay Area partners to help support um, access uh, to legal uh, services for folks in that detention facility. Um, we also have seen a lot of Bay Area organizations open satellite offices or kind of deploy staff to our region to, to kind of bulk up their presence and services um, in, the, in the San Joaquin Valley. So there's a lot of creative, um, proactive steps being taken uh, to address this justice gap. But we have a lot of remaining challenges, given the scale of the population in our region and the geographic uh, region our service providers are, are serving. Um, so first of all, we really have um, 
a lack of attorneys who are providing certain types of assistance, um, specifically uh, representation for folks who are in removal proceedings. So removal defense is something where we're, we're growing, we're, we're going in the right direction, uh, but we're still far behind the need. Um, when I've done a survey, um, in terms of full-time staff attorneys based in the Central Valley providing removal defense services, I could only count three organizations that are providing that. So in this eight county region with, you know, nearly a million um, immigrants, uh, immigrant residents, we have only three organizations that provide that type of very specific service. Um, we're also really behind on providing um, asylum assistance. Uh, we're seeing a huge increase in the number of asylum seekers in our region uh, from Afghanistan, from Central America, parts of Mexico, um, and we're really struggling to keep pace with that, that demand for uh, legal support for asylum seekers. So that's an area we really need to continue to, to work at. Um, you know, the geography is really critical because our rural residents are oftentimes living very, very far from the legal service providers who are most often located in large urban centers like Fresno, like Bakersfield, like Stockton. So people in rural Tulare County, uh, where I live, rural Merced County, you know, sometimes are looking at a two hour drive just to get to a legal service provider. So when you think about that, you know, um, if it's, uh, you know, you need to go to an appointment to meet with an attorney or an accredited rep just about your case, maybe you have to have, you know, two or three follow-up appointments to, to work on your case and finalize it. Uh, maybe you have to go back to Fresno for uh, an appointment with the um, immigration service. So it's really a huge burden on our rural residents um, to, in terms of, um, getting time off work, childcare, other demands, and then of course the lack of transportation. And it's not uncommon for us to hear about uh, low-income residents who lack transportation having to, to, you know, to pay $50, $100, $200 to get a ride to one of those urban centers for those appointments. So it's a huge, huge burden. Uh, three counties in our region have no immigration legal service organization operating at all. Uh, Merced County is my county is one of them. Uh, Madera is another one. So we also need to, we, we need to think strategically about how to deploy resources in those underserved counties specifically. And then we're also um, a little we're behind in terms of integrating the, the linguistic and cultural capacity with our legal services uh, uh, providers. So, um, you know, there are wonderful community organizations serving, a, you know, di diverse immigrant populations, uh, but our legal service providers are often limited uh, in terms of their language capacity to English and Spanish. Um, and so a lot of our, for example, Southeast Asian community members, South Asian community members, um, indigenous community members from Mexico and Central America, um, our legal service providers uh, don't always have the capacity to serve them. So we need to do more to kind of integrate um, that l uh, linguistic and cultural capacity with our legal services capacity to reach those and ensure people are getting um, the services that they, that they need and deserve. Um, and then, you know, big ongoing challenge for our region is just immigration fraud. Wherever there's a lack of legal service providers, we see a huge increase in immigration fraud. Um, you know, that means people are paying for services that are never uh, provided. Uh, sometimes they are told they're eligible for something that they're not eligible for. Sometimes they file uh, cases and applications with the immigration service only to have those cases denied. Um, Honestly, in the best case scenario, people lose money. Worst case scenario, people can be deported uh, and separated from their family. So it's a very serious problem. But I think as we tackle our overall legal capacity issue, we will see a decrease in that as we make more trustworthy legal service um, um, uh, providers available to people, especially in those rural and isolated communities. So overall, you know, we've seen a lot of growth in our capacity in, in the region. Uh, it's thanks in large part to investments by the state of California in immigration uh, legal services, uh, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, I'm very um, optimistic that we're moving in the right direction, um, that we're growing, um, and that we have so many strong uh, local advocates who are stepping into this space and providing those critical services. You know, Eduardo mentioned that I was um, an attorney at Center Legal 
uh, de la Raza. That was about 15 years ago. Um, and I was the only uh, immigration attorney on staff at that organization. Uh, and now 15 years later, they have over 15 immigration staff attorneys working. They're one of the largest immigration legal service providers um, in the state. Uh, so to me, that's just proof that growth can happen. It's going to look a little bit different in the San Joaquin Valley than it does in the Bay Area in a Bay Area based organization. But that just shows you that that type of growth um, is really, really possible. So I'm I'm very hopeful um, and know we have a lot of potential to, to, to address this justice gap. Uh, next slide. I want to highlight what I think is one of the ways we can make these kind of very strategic investments and build models that really address the needs of our region. And I want to highlight for just a moment the California Immigration Legal Fellowship. Um, this is the first state funded uh, immigration legal fellowship in the nation. Uh, it was uh, inaugurated in January 2021 and it trained a cohort of 10 new immigration attorneys all about in all aspects of immigration law. It assigned them a mentor attorney who worked very closely with them and is supervising their uh, legal work and then placed them at um, immigration nonprofits, legal nonprofits in underserved uh, areas of our state. So we're very lucky to have six immigration legal fellows um, here in the San Joaquin Valley. There are four fellows placed at organizations in the central coast of California. And it's really meeting multiple needs, right? It's addressing uh, the legal needs of community members by providing free, high quality legal services, especially to those um, who are facing um, immigration court proceedings, so are in removal proceedings. Uh, it's also supporting the next generation of immigration advocates by providing them with intensive training and mentorship. And then it's enhancing the legal capacity of local organizations so that they can grow and provide more and more complex legal services to their um, communities. Um, so we were, we've been very lucky to implement this, this pilot program. Um, we're about a year and a half into it. Um, there is funding. We're hoping for full funding for this project in the in the budget for next year so that we can uh, extend the work of the current 10 fellows and also bring on a new cohort of 10 fellows um, uh, for an, for a new three year um, fellowship program. Um, we're grateful to Assembly Member Rambula for his uh, leadership for championing uh, this really important um, model. Um, so, you know, Stay tuned and hopefully this is something we can keep building this momentum and building our capacity in the region. Um, I'm going to leave my comments there and hand it over to someone who has a lot more expertise on the fellowship. <laughs> and that's my colleague Osvaldo, who's a current fellow, um, and he's going to walk you through um, what the fellowship has meant for him and his clients. But I just want to say he's really represents what this model is all about and what we need is more people like Osvaldo uh, practicing immigration law in our region. I sleep better at night knowing there's young advocates like Osvaldo um, doing doing this important critical legal work in the community. So I'll leave it to Eduardo to properly introduce you, Osvaldo, but thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Allison, for the introduction and for all your kind words. Um, could I get my slides up? please. I think my slides were a little orange. I can go, I can start talking without them. So uh, my name is Osvaldo Hidalgo Tamendi. I work at Community Justice Alliance, uh, the office in Fresno, California. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more, before I talk about the project, I want to talk about why the uh, fellowship means so much to me. Ah, okay, it, it appears I did not, there was an issue with the slides. I guess. Um, okay, so I wanna speak about why this fellowship is so important to me. I was born and raised here in the Valley. My name is, I'm sorry. I'm, I was born and raised here in the Valley in Madera, California, just North here, Fresno, where I work every day. Growing up in the valley, you know, it's, you see a lot of people being from a family of immigrants. I saw people, you know, my family, my parents, my tios and tias affected by immigration laws each and every day, uh, limited in the work that they could do, 
limited in the, the choices they can make and you know limited in places they could they could go. I've had to I've had the experience of seeing my parents go through the immigration process, see them struggle through it, and I have the experience of seeing you know my family go through it now, and just the differences are immense. But uh, I think it was watching these my family friends, neighbors go through these processes that made me want to use my privilege of being, you know, born in the United States, being able to go to school, you know, use those privileges to help people like my parents, like my family. So I, that's why I chose to go to law school. Uh, that's why I worked hard to go to law school. And that's why I graduated law school to help people. Now, it, if you asked me three years ago, where would I see myself uh, career wise? I don't think I would be able to say that I saw myself in the Central Valley working. I didn't see it as a possibility. I wanted to help people in an immigration path, but it just, you know, you have to, yeah, first you have to learn the things. You know, I, I tried to learn as much as I could in law school, but it can only prepare you so much. You know, I, I feel like I'm learning things every day here in the immigration practice. And I've been working at it for a year and a half directly. So it's just, this is an amazing opportunity. Uh, you know, school is also expensive. I didn't know if I'd be able to pay for it. And this fellowship has given me the opportunity to be able to do the work that I wanted to do, you know, 10 years early. I'm able to come in here into the Central Valley, into my home with my people and represent them in immigration court or in, in front of USCIS or in any of the type of uh, immigration proceedings. So um, it's just amazing that I've been able to have this opportunity handed to me. Now, the immigration and legal, the California Immigrant Legal Fellowship uh, is not only a great resource to the Valley, but it's also a resource to people like me. So it's a great resource for the Valley because as Allison, my colleague just mentioned, there was only around like three, a handful of attorneys here or organizations in the Valley that have removal defense services or removal defense staff attorneys full time. You know, when we came in, we more than doubled that, those services. And not only that, but we're at these nonprofits where we can provide that service for free. Money can be a big barrier for this community. And the fact that I can do my job and say, I'm not going to charge you anything, you know, go to a family who they have a family member in immigrant detention and say, I'm not going to charge you for this. Don't worry about it. I've got you. It's just an amazing feeling. When people ask you how much, like, say, when people ask me about my career choices, they said, why can't, why don't you go into somewhere else where you can make more money? And I'd say, like, you know, it's not about the money. It's about the people I can help. And not only the people I can help, but the way I can help them in a way that's accessible to them. And I think it's amazing that we can provide these services and removal defense, which is not, you know, it's not very common in Central Valley to find removal defense services and for free. Um, and it's also an opportunity for attorneys like me, like I said uh, before, it gives me the chance to practice this years earlier than I think I would have been able to, instead of you know going into other nonprofits and trying to learn the ropes from other colleagues or go work into government jobs like the public defender's office and you know try to pay off my student loans. I can just do that directly here. So I think this is a the this is a blessing to be able to be in this position. Now I'm gonna go directly into what kind of you know the direct impact that I've seen in this fellowship. So first. We've been able to go directly into detention centers to uh, not like get clients, but to have intakes with people. So we've been able to go to Golden State and McFarland. Uh, we've had uh, partners go into Dublin, which is a federal institution, but it also houses our immigrant population and help people with cases such as uh, you know um, prosecutorial discretion and uh, asylum applications, bond hearings, and direct merits hearings. So it's been um it's amazing that there's organizations in Los Angeles, there's organization in the Bay Area that are able to go into these uh, centers and do these or uh, intakes and talk communicate with his family members. But I think there's something so much more special about having people directly in the Central Valley to go talk to these people, saying, "Oh, I know where you're from," or being able to go speak directly with their families. Like I've had fa I've had to go to family members' houses to get documents to be able to submit it for their loved ones, a bond hearing. So I think it's just it's so amazing that we're able to uh, be there directly for the people of the Valley. And I also wanna talk, uh, hit on, um, you know, something that my colleague Allison said about, you know, asylum cases. Uh, I, right now I have about five cases that are removal defense cases that involve asylum 
or an application for asylum. And those are only the ones I've been able to take. There are many more cases that I've had. There's like 10 cases, I think, this year alone that I've had to refer out. Uh, and, you know, also with unaccompanied minor cases. Uh, Community Justice Alliance, the org I work for right now, was created because there was such a need for un to help unaccompanied minors in the Central Valley. And again, you know, I, I have three or four cases right now that involve, you know, special immigrant juvenile status or unaccompanied minors, and I've had to refer out so many more. So as as it just goes to show how important this work, how much need there is, and uh, and. The fact that I get to do it makes me so happy, and I'm sure that makes the community members just as happy as well. Uh, so cases with criminal issues have also been a, somewhere where I feel like we've made a, a huge progress. So there are, organiz there are I have had two clients, th three clients with criminal issues so far, and um, some that sometimes it breaks my heart to hear what they say. Uh, when they when they first come to me, they said, oh, thank you for helping me. I've gone to different organizations and they've refused to take my case or they've told me I've had no case because I've had these criminal issues. And after further review, you, you'll find that, you know, there are ways around it, but, you know, they have been rejected because of stigma or more likely because, you know, their organizations aren't funded to take cases like that. And, you know, my fellowship, I'm so blessed to be able to say that, you know, we have no restrictions like that. If it's a removal defense case, we can take it. If we, and we will, you know, stand by everyone, regardless of, you know, the, regardless of what they did on the worst day of their life or what happened on the worst day of their life or, you know, fought, even, you know, wrongful convictions, but we'll be there to represent those people. And I feel like, you know, there's this huge intersection between the criminal justice system and the immigration carceral system. And, you know, to be able to bridge that gap as well, and not, not just with affirmative cases, but in removal defense cases and to keep people in the country is just uh, amazing. And I'm so glad that I'm able to do that every day. Uh, lastly, we're giving community members an option. Like we said before, uh, there are few nonprofits in the area. Money can be an issue um, and choices can be an issue. I had a, I had a case where my, uh, m a friend of my mother, who found out that I was an attorney because, you know, Latino, Latinx parents like to brag about their children. Uh, my mother, my sweet mother was bragging about me. And this friend came to me or asked my mom for my number and called me and said, hey, I have this attorney, but they're not helping me. They're making me do this on my own. They're making me do this on my own. And they're not explaining to me the process. Can you help me? And so we went through the process of figuring out, you know, what the issues were, um, we helped her, you know, go through the process of explain to her that if she wants to switch attorneys, I, you know, with the, the, you know, the legal ethical pathway of switching attorneys and helping with the process. And I can gladly say that she's a legal permanent resident now. So I think it's amazing that we're giving people options. They don't have to choose an attorney. They don't have to have an attorney just because that's the only attorney they can have. There are other attorneys they can come to, people who understand them, who know the language, who know the culture, who know them personally, uh, or who that, you know, who can stand up in front of an immigration judge or in front of USCIS and, you know, tell their story and help them um, succeed and you know, get just get a fair chance at the American dream. And I think at the end of the day, that's what myself and my colleagues in the fellowship and my colleagues who are doing all this important work here in Equity on the Mall are all about. So yeah, that is my spiel on the Immigration Legal Resource Fellowship. Thank you very much, Osvaldo. Uh, and thank you so much, Allison, also as well for uh, your presentation. It really ties in greatly to Osvaldo's. And, you know, because they've been great presentations, I'm sure, you know, they've produced um, a very interesting and great questions. So we, we invite, you know, the audience to, you know, note those questions um, and we're gonna have some time at the end reserve so you can um, ask them directly to, to the panelists. Uh, but thank you so much again, um, Osvaldo um, and, and Allison. We're going to transition now to our next two panelists. Uh, who are gonna be speaking uh, uh, more about, you know, other, you know, immigration related issues, you know, some intersections that they may have with, um, access to other safety net programs and overall, you know, 
uh, the general experience of, you know, incorporating themselves and, and um, their community members into, into American society, specifically here in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our next two panelists, um, Hugo Morales and Oralia Maceda. Uh, Hugo Morales is the co-founder and executive director of Radio Bilingue, a Fresno-based Latino public educational uh, radio network with 25 stations in the Western U.S., and it is the leading producer of Spanish news and cultural programming in the U.S. public media. A meat stick Indian from Oaxaca, uh, Mexico, Hugo's work has been recognized with a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, the Corporation of Public Broadcasting's Edward R. Murrow Award, the Lenin Foundation Cultural Freedom Prize, and a National Endowment for the Arts Heritage Fellowship. He is a trustee of the Rosenberg Foundation and past trustee of the California Endowment and the California State University System, among many others. And joining Hugo on this panel is Aurelia Maceda. Uh, Aurelia Maceda is a director of programs at Centro Binacional para el Desarrollo Indígena. She is Mixteco. She lives in Fresno and has over 28 years of experience in activism and civic engagement, um, all dedicated to helping advance social justice. Uh, so please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Aurelia and Hugo uh, to the stage, and we're happy to have you. Go ahead, Hugo. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, muy buenos dias. Good morning. Uh, again, my name is Hugo Morales, and I'm uh, the co-founder of Radio Bilingue, and also the um, uh, executive director of, uh, of, of Radio Bilingue. And uh, indígena, immigrant, former uh, farm worker, uh, child labor, began working in the fields when I was eight years old. And as Allison was referring to, uh, you know, there are assets in the San Joaquin Valley, and one of those assets is Radio Bilingue. And I, I also want to say that uh, uh, I too want to brag about Oswaldo and, and Allison and also Oralia, because and, and the rest of, of the partners here participating in this event. I think they're doing an incredible job in a geographical area that is, is challenged, I mean, about the people. So anyway, I want to I wanna brag about all of them. So Radio Bilingue began as a project in 1976, and it was a community project, literally involving hundreds of, of local people here in the, initially in the Fresno area. It included, uh, Joaquin Garambula's uh, parents, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, Amy and, and, and Juan. Uh, so uh, this was a, truly a, 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 a project of immigrants, a, a project of farm worker. Juan Garambula himself was a child laborer, uh, you know, like myself uh, as a child and as a teen. Uh, and we worked in the fields together. So Radio Bilingue began broadcasting in July 4th, 1980. Uh, and for broadcasting from San Juan County all the way to Kern, uh, with and is the only uh, FM radio service, uh, commercial or non-commercial, that can reach with one signal uh, in, throughout the whole valley. Uh, and it is owned and controlled by the Latino community. Uh, and I also want to say that all of the um, uh, producers of Radio Bilingue content are immigrants themselves. And we also engage volunteers, including a team of three indígena mixtecas that take over the microphones on Sundays to engage in a conversation our mixteca community, mixteco community in the U.S. and in Mexico, because we also broadcast into Mexico a lot during those Sundays uh, uh, shows in mixteco. And it's a conversation. Uh, and it's about dealing with the issues at hand, the challenges, the dreams, and dedications that are across, uh, you know, and, and enjoying the traditional music of Chilenas and so on that are so much part of our indigenous uh, um, culture and, and way of life. I also want to point out to the importance of this asset, as, as Allison was referring to, in, in independent evaluations that we've done of Radio Bilingo, particularly in the past 22 years, the latest one was done this year, where again, it confirmed that our listeners turn to Radio Bilingo because it's an honest and trustworthy platform. Uh, and that, uh, that, they also, that we also broadcast in a language that they understand. And that they, sh they share the information uh, with the family, they act on the information, 
and they also share that information with friends. So that's uh, that's really good because we, the founders, that's what we were hoping for and envision, and 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 it has really come to be and at, at the uh, for a community that is really in need. Uh, Radio Blingo reaches different segments of the immigrant uh, community through traditional music, see mariachis, or like I was saying, chilenas and other uh, uh, indigenous uh, music rooted in our community. And so, uh, and we also use, uh, you know, short messages, PSAs, like on, on live interactive interviews where we invite our partners, including those that are in this panel or participating in this event. Uh, so in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's a way for us to have a conversation with our audience live. And so use of short live interviews. Uh, also, we use, um, we open our microphones to our partners. Uh, every one of our, of our uh, panelists here has been on Radio Bilingue. Um, and we consistently use these powerful airwaves to give the microphone to our nonprofit partners, as I was saying. In recent months, we were promoting immigrant assistant workshops from our partners, naturalization uh, workshops from our, again, our partners, DACA assistance workshops from our partners, public charge information, including Allison has been on the air about that, and encouraging immigrants to use services they can legally uh, use, you know, um, and asylum uh, proceedings, refugee uh, rights, um, Title 42, naturalization services and workshops, applying for fee waivers for naturalization, uh, taking the citizenship test in Spanish instead of English, and the qualifications for that. Uh, these are all topics of our partners provide uh, through our airwaves. And also we pro produce some of these uh, um, you know, messages. And among the other things that we do, we provide information to our immigrant community on COVID. Free testing is something that CBDIO and others uh, we've been partnering with. Free testing, vaccines, regardless of the documentation. And also we are engaged in emergency preparedness information. It's about the fires, the drought, heat illness. Again, we have farm workers working in over hundred degree weather um, and we and many have died. Uh, and so we wanna make sure in the San Joaquin Valley, we wanna make sure that they are protected. And also there's new laws that, that have been passed recently to protect uh, the workers, so we want to make sure they know their rights and, and we can reach them at their home, in the fields, in the cars, and, and, and wherever they may be. And I just also want to mention that uh, the, that uh, our uh, valued airwaves and, and content is not part of the Library of Congress because Library of Congress has recognized the importance of this. So this way, again, one of the assets. I last want to um, I mention about a little bit about civic because Jesus Martinez could not uh, participate this morning. Um, and uh, I want to say that civic is again, another one of those assets that was born over 10 years ago uh, to be a collaborative of, of services because again, we, as Allison was referring to, we lack capacity uh, in the legal area, but other areas in, in, in respect to services uh, to uh, immigrants. And so uh, Civic, uh, under the leadership of Jesus Martinez, is leading that effort. And uh, in that, and includes more recently, uh, uh, giving the capacity of immigrants to establish businesses and to manage their businesses. And then I just want to introduce Oralia Maceda from CDAO, who's an outstanding leader in, in our, uh, in our uh, community and originally from, I'm proudly saying, our state of Oaxaca. Oralia. Gracias, Hugo. Eh, gracias, gracias por este, también esta oportunidad de poder compartir uh, lo que estamos haciendo como Centro Binacional. Y mm, ya lo habían mencionado, yo soy Oralia, tra Oralia Maceda, trabajo con Centro Binacional para el Desarrollo Indígena Oaxaqueño. Y parte de nuestra misión del Centro Binacional es asegurar el bienestar de nuestras comunidades indígenas migrantes. 
Uh, y por esta razón, ahorita vamos, estamos muy involucrados en apoyar la exclusión de los trabajadores y más que se, eh, se vio en esta, en esta pandemia, cómo este, fueron afectados los um, trabajadores, uh, los trabajadores en general, pero también en particular los trabajadores del campo. Uh, y vamos, nos, uh, ahorita varios estudios. Han, han ayudado a, este, a, pues a documentar lo que por años ya sabemos, ¿verdad?, que está pasando. Y ahorita nos referimos también al estudio que, que hizo UC Merced a través del de Centro de um, Trabajadores que tiene. Y en este estudio, um, después de hablar con varios trabajadores, encontramos los resultados que hay un millón de trabajadores en California uh, o el 6% de trabajadores que son indocumentados. Y muchos, uh, muchos de ellos son los trabajadores indocumentados enfrentan a uh, los niveles mayores de inseguridad económica o este, que los trabajadores de, del campo son los que pues ganan menos, tienen menos uh, salario y este, son las personas más afectadas, son las personas que no cuentan con un salario digno. Entonces, este, también ahorita lo que estamos uh, viendo en este estudio, que seis de cada diez niños viven en hogares de trabajadores no ciudadanos, Um, que, vi, que viven con un salario bajo, uh, mes, menos del salario mínimo que deberían, o el salario digno que deberían tener, ¿no? Entonces, esto es algo muy preocupante, es algo que debemos de, de poner atención uh, o que nuestros representantes deben poner atención a este, a este problema que estamos viviendo. Um, y la siguiente, entonces, ¿cómo, ¿qué vamos a hacer? ¿Qué vamos a hacer o cómo vamos a abordar este, este problema? Este problema que excluye a, a los trabajadores um, de beneficios que pudieran obtener. Y es importante que abordemos este tema juntos, tanto nuestros representantes como las um, organizaciones, la gente de la com comunidad, que abordemos este, este tema que, es un, um, que excluye a los trabajadores que no cuentan con, con documentos. Y debemos... Um, y es lo que, uh, lo que estamos tratando de hacer y necesitamos abordar la exclusión racista que ha existido por mucho tiempo y que ha tenido un impacto económico devastador en las comunidades inmigrantes, en particular durante ahorita la pandemia de COVID-19, ¿no? Se vio todo, toda esta exclusión que existe en el derechos y servicios que necesitan nuestras, nuestras comunidades y Uh, aunque a pesar de que el gobierno dijo que son trabajadores esenciales, en la práctica no vemos que hagan este reconocimiento. Sabemos que, que el gobierno durante este tiempo implementó programas que solamente tapaban un poquito este, este problema, pero que no son la solución y no, no resuelven el problema de fondo. ¿no? Entonces, uh, es, es importante que nosotros nos unamos y podamos asegurar de que ya no exista esa exclusión. Um, entonces, uh, ahorita lo que, nos, lo que vemos es que para, este, para que para que California tenga una recuperación económica equitativa de, de la pandemia y construya un futuro económico resistente debe poner fin a, esta, a estas exclusiones históricas para los trabajadores indocumentados. ¿Cómo? A través de leyes, a través de leyes que, a, que ayuden a que, que ayuden a los a que los trabajadores tengan a estos beneficios. ¿no? Y ahorita en particular se está, se está um, empujando la la iniciativa de ley que es este, la AB 2847. Y esta, esta, esta ley 
ha, ha sido presentada en la asamblea por el asambleísta Eduardo García. Y esta, esta iniciativa de ley es una iniciativa muy importante porque viene de la comunidad. La comunidad um, de trabajadores de los diferentes sectores se han unido para poder asegurar que se incluya este, que se incluya a los trabajadores en, en documentados, a todos los trabajadores, para que tengan un beneficio de desempleo. Y esto ha sido un, un trabajo de comunitario, quienes han decidido cómo quieren que sea esta ley, qué, qué debería de tener esta, esta ley. Y son las mismas personas de la comunidad quienes están trabajando todavía para asegurar que esta iniciativa de ley Uh, pase y se, aben, y se beneficien los trabajadores uh, que están excluidos de, del seguro de desempleo. ¿Y qué, qué, es, qué haría esto, este seguro de desempleo, si es que llegara a pasar? Esto ayudaría a que las personas que no cuentan ahorita o que no pueden recibir el seguro de desempleo lo reciban y que sean 300 dólares semanales los que puedan recibir cuando se queden sin desempleo y que sea por un mínimo de 20 semanas de recibir este beneficio. Este, esto se piensa como un plan piloto que iniciaría en el mes de enero del 2023 a diciembre 31 del 2023. Entonces, esta es una iniciativa o es una propuesta que la comunidad quiere que, que pase. Y, y quién, quiénes van a hacer todo este esfuerzo, la misma gente, ¿no? Pero queremos asegurar que nuestros representantes, los asambleístas, los senadores, sean conscientes de que para terminar la inequidad que existe, deben de poner atención y ver quiénes están quedando fuera, que son los trabajadores sin documentos y son quienes han aportado mucho durante todo el tiempo, pero más ahorita en la pandemia. ¿Por qué? Porque son los únicos que podían seguir trabajando, porque no tenían el privilegio de quedarse en casa, de quedarse en casa sin trabajar y sin poder recibir ningún beneficio, tanto del gobierno estatal como del gobierno federal. A pesar de que hubo pequeños programas, esos programas no, son, no fueron ni son la solución al grave problema que existe ahorita. ¿Qué vamos a hacer para terminar con esta exclusión? Asegurar que, que los trabajadores tengan un salario digno, un salario digno que puedan vivir y que puedan um, sobrevivir una pandemia o un desastre en el, cuando ocurran en el estado o en el país. Entonces, ¿Qué más podemos hacer? Asegurar que todos tengamos derechos como seres humanos que, que, que somos y que vivimos en este estado, en este país. Entonces, solamente con esta, de esta manera vamos a poder demostrar o el gobierno va a poder demostrar que realmente los trabajadores son esenciales y que los trabajadores inmigrantes aportan una gran aportan todo su esfuerzo y son importantes para la economía de este estado y no solamente para la economía sino también como comunidades mm. como comunidades este, indígenas migrantes también vemos que aportamos mucho a este a, al país al estado donde, al lugar donde vivimos a, con nuestra riqueza cultural y hacemos de este estado un estado fuerte en su economía un estado um, multicultural y plurilingüe porque traemos nuestros, nuestras lenguas y todo lo que tenemos. Entonces, ¿qué, qué pueden hacer ahorita los este, legisladores? Asegurar que todos los trabajadores tengan los beneficios que necesitan como este, uh, trabajadores Um, como seres humanos. Entonces, eso es lo que nosotros estamos también como centro binacional asegurando de terminar esa exclusión racista que existe en este momento. Y yo creo que eso sería todo lo que puedo compartir en esta, ahorita. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Oralia. Uh, and also, thank you very much, Hugo, for, for your guys' um, joint presentation. Um, And thank you to all the panelists as well that preceded uh, Hugo and Oralia. And we have a few minutes left for questions. You know, I want to do open up this space in case, you know, there are any questions from the audience that came in uh, or, or from partners, um, you know, and I like to, you know, give a, 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 at least 
four, four minutes for that before we transition on to another great uh, uh, panel that's going to be the health subcommittee who's going to be taking on the discussion on the uh, crossover of immigration and health care and uh, other uh, public and earned benefits um, during their, their, their panel. So what, I do want to open this up for, for any questions or comments the audience may have. One question that, you know, we we received, um, you know, recent uh, frequently is, you know, is we see this administration and uh, at the state level uh, expanding certain public benefits and certain earned benefits. Right. Uh, for example, the Medi-Cal expansion um, and and, you know, we see other efforts to expand things like uh, unemployment insurance for undocumented workers. Um, and a lot of people ask, you know, are undocumented individuals, should they be worrying about, you know, participating in any of these benefits? Uh, we know there were a lot of public charge reforms in the past, uh, but right now as it stands, you know, should undocumented workers be concerned uh, if they were to need to participate on Medi-Cal, for example, or in the future, if they, if they are elig el eligible to, part to, to, to participate in an earned benefit like unemployment insurance. Uh, Allison, do you have any, any, any thoughts on that? Sure, yeah, thanks Eduardo. This, this continues to be a, a big concern in the, in the community. And I think it's really important to clarify that there was a change on what's called the public charge rule under the Trump administration um, that was really like a wealth test for immigrant families who were trying to get uh, a green card through a relative. That, that strict public charge test has been revoked. It was revoked um, last March 2021 uh, by the Biden administration. So that very strict public charge rule no longer exists. Um, unfortunately, the fear it instilled is still very present for people. And I think we need to continue to get the message out that especially in the state of California, it is safe for immigrants to access any uh, benefits and services they are eligible for. And I'm particularly concerned about uh, Medi-Cal right now. Uh, people are eligible to get emergency Medi-Cal, uh, Medi-Cal for pregnant people, uh, Medi-Cal um, for people under the age of 26, and now for people uh, age 50 and over, regardless of their immigration status. We really want to see people take advantage of those opportunities and not let public charge um, have the, the chilling effect it has had. So we really want to encourage people to get the benefits they need and, and have the right to access and, 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 and receive. Wonderful. Thank you, Allison. But another question we came in is, you know, it says, with California's historic surplus, what is your hope for the San Joaquin Valley to receive those more dollars to support the immigration work you all are described uh, during your presentations today? Uh, anybody want to take that on? Okay. I'd be willing to speak to a piece of that. I don't know. What yeah, that's please about. go ahead as well, though. I think uh, like my colleague Allison mentioned earlier, you know, our organ, our fellowship is only funded for two years uh, and we just got refunded, but not fully for a third year. I'd like to see more people like me in the area, more people, you know, Central Valley born and raised come back and have these opportunities that I've had. I don't want to just stop here. I want more immigration services for the people of the Central Valley. So and it's a huge step that we got this fellowship that you know the people before me who got this fellowship off the ground and funded and you know and we're doing the work now so i'd like to see that continued and expanded so that people you know can get access to direct services and legal services in the valley yeah this is who go i think a lot of it is around uh access to resources that was that's why i think one of the key things that has really helped has been the sierra health foundation uh in the center because uh, that has really expanded opportunities uh, uh, beyond what, you know, the state is providing uh, so that there'd be more, uh, uh, more support for the uh, services that immigrants need. And also not only have, have has uh, the 
Sierra Health Foundation be a- been able to leverage that, but also they've encouraged other foundations to come in and help uh, the nonprofits here. So a lot of it, from my vantage point, is around uh, access to resources. So we do have folks like Allison and 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 Oswaldo who are from here stay here uh, to be able to uh, help uh, immigrants. And I'm really proud of those two. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chico and Osvaldo and, and Allison for tackling on those questions. And this brings us to the top of the hour. Uh, but I do want to invite you, you know, to continue this conversation um, later today. The San Joaquin Valley Health Fund uh, will share some details about upcoming uh, town halls that we're going to be engaging in, in the rest of 2022. So we invite you to stay tuned for that. And we also invite you to please stay tuned for our next panel, which is going to be the, uh, the health subcommittee. Uh, they have an excellent presentation that's going to pick up a little bit on this crossover of immigration and health and public benefits and earned benefits um, and you know some of the messaging and opportunities we have there as well. So thank you, everyone, on this panel today. And I'll hand it off to you, Sergio. Thanks, Eduardo. And thank you, Immigration Subcommittee, for the great information and amazing presentation. Um, and as Eduardo said, again, and we talked about before the last couple of days, this work isn't done in silos. Our communities and residents don't face these issues in silos. Um, so we must also then be working at the intersections of all these issues. And again, as Eduardo talked about our next presentation uh, by the health committee, we'll start to speak about the intersection of health and immigration um, and thinking about plans for like health for all. Um, so I wanna thank again, the immigration subcommittee uh, for a beautiful presentation. Uh, again, our next IHEAL subcommittee presentation is from the health subcommittee. Um, advocates and community leaders will highlight COVID-19, health for all, women's health and privacy, uh, and then public health issues uh, and mental health issues as well, followed by community stories um, that will help kind of drive the, the reality of this work home. Um, this will be an interactive uh, uh, session, so be ready. Uh, again, I will say, if you want to take advantage of the polls and, uh, tra- and interpreter services, uh, that we have here in hop in so you can register now at www.equityonthemall.org uh, and click on the register now to get the link for hop in uh, to be able to join in on on all that's going to happen in the next uh, couple of hours so again uh, health committee uh, i'm going to ask you to come to the stage and and, and you know, i'll turn the mic over to you hello i'm congressman jim costa and it is so apparent i think to so many of us after this horrific pandemic that uh Healthcare is one of the most important issues that we have to deal with. In our valley, we have a shortage of physicians and nurses. That's why I'm working to build a medical school here in our valley using state and federal funding, combined with UC Merced, UCSF, medical education effort, uh, and our other resources here in the valley. But not only do we have a physician shortage, we have a nursing shortage as well. That's why I was able to provide almost a half a million dollars working with Fresno City College's nursing program and Fresno State's nursing program to enhance their efforts to train more nurses, uh, which we so much need in all of our healthcare facilities, our hospitals, our clinics. Clearly, more physicians, more nurses, and having the educational capacity to have a full-fledged medical school and to improve our nursing programs that we already have in our community colleges in Fresno State is absolutely essential to improving the quality of health care for the people in, in the San Joaquin Valley. Thank you again. So that was a video, a short video from Congressman uh, Jim Costa, who 